Uh, welcome Thanks everyone. Um, it's my honor to introduce Pete. Uh, Pete has honor. been a founder, started a company, uh, Talent Bin, sold it to Monster, and then uh, started uh, started a company uh, more very, more recently called Atrium. He's mm -hmm. doing a performance and sales uh, monitoring and management. Uh, he has also been a sales so he uh, for a long time. He so was first sales rep, first uh, sales manager for a company, BP of, first BP of sales and also go on leading six, uh, over 600 sales rep at Monster. Uh, he is also an educator leading. So he uh, <laughs> he's, uh, has written books on sales. He has started uh, a very interesting uh, sales organization called Sales Law, uh, teaching people on sales. So he's been a passionate educator as well, in addition to being a founder and a sales person. Uh, he's gonna teach us, uh, uh, show, share with us a little bit more on what Founder-led selling is about how do you sell when you're a founder when you're early stage company. Uh, I couldn't find a better speaker on this topic, so please welcome uh, Pete. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so this is super small, so I'm not going to sit here and like, present you guys. Uh, this is just going to be like more conversational um, for my my setup right here. I think it would probably be pretty helpful. So is everyone doing B2B stuff? No, you're B2B. Yeah, but not. Oh, okay. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, more or less, because like, that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, can we just go around really quick? I read everybody's bios off of the little bio board down there, so like, I may have your company like, in RAM right now. Um, but let's just like flip through really quick and just tell me like what your first name is, and then what your um, what your company does. If you don't know what it does, then you can just be like, I'm Susie. So, and then that way, what I can do is, like, as we're going through examples here, we can, like, make it personal to, to you all. So, let, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Yang. I run Social Insights. It's a data for social impact consultancy. So, cool. we do a lot of, I guess, selling to clients and projects. Totally. Yeah, and it can be really brief. I just want to, like, understand how it works. I'm Anisha. It's called Slab. We're building knowledge sharing software for teams. Okay. Nick Hill, um, I dimensional we're Recruiting stuff. All right, killer. Back here. Uh, I'm Jason. Also working on Slab with Okay. Cool. You. Chen Ye. What can we say? Slab. All right, killer. You. Hey, I'm pretty. Uh, what? Yeah. Pretty. Is. Uh, What's the question? Yeah. <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are you working on? What, 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 what are you doing? Like? I already know it. I already yeah. know it. Actually, I'm working on a, a trust, building a trust network to identify who's good at what within your network. Got it. All right, you. I'm Ur. I just quit my job. I'm dabbling in multiple projects. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm Edward. I don't have a company, but I'm just in general focused on B2B ideas and looking at that kind of stuff right now. Okay, so. how does you? Um, I'm Ashley. I work for the SBC Fund. And we just started three weeks ago and doing a project management for the staff. Sweet. Yeah, these, these two folks are the uh, I'm Jeff. I'm still exploring. Okay, cool. Hey, I'm Michael. I'm working on a company that's corporate sponsored daycare as a benefit. Nice. Okay, cool. You have a lot of selling there. You yeah. In HR. <laughs> Hi, yep. I'm Florence. I'm working on a mobile app for spontaneous event coordination and discovery. Event coordination? Mm -hmm. So you said? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm Carl. Working on a, a company that is creating synthetic data for all the secure data sets. It'll never work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Andrew. I'm working with Carl, but regretting it. <laughs> okay, with you. Hi, I'm Dion. Just showed up. Uh, I'm working on Forethought. We're building uh, Alexa for the enterprise. It's for the enterprise. Okay, cool. Like search? Yes. Okay. AI card enterprise search. Cool. So you, you, you love the fact that Atani shot all over enterprise search for you? Yeah, not at all. <laughs> okay, cool. Fabulous. I probably won't remember your name, but I'll remember the, the stuff that you're working on, so that's kind of the important thing here. Um, so we have, I think we have like 45, is that what we got? 45 and then 15 for today. Okay, cool. We can run it however. Yeah, can. so, I mean, the funny thing is, is that you like my headshot from the first round review article. Mm -hmm. They did get a bunch of headshots for me. Um, I have like even less hair now. Um, so, yeah, the, the, goal, the goal of this talk is not to be a talk really, but it's to impress upon you a couple of different things that one, that, that for the most part, if you're doing B2B in some sort of capacity, you're going to have to do some sort of selling behavior, some sort of direct selling behavior, um, which is, which we'll get into a little bit here. For whatever reason, the Valley has a little bit of an antipathy for that, for reasons we'll kind of touch on. 
So that's the first thing. So you're going to have to do it. And the second thing, it, or else you're going to fuck up your company. Um, and the second thing that you're going to, uh, the second thing we're going to talk about is that it's totally within your ability to do. It. So like that, I think that's one of the reasons why people are oftentimes afraid of that, is because they think it's like some sort of magical thing, and they're like, oh my goodness, you know, salespeople are born that way, or what have you. That's totally not the case. It's just it's just a craft. It's a skill, the same as any other, and with enough like like practice, you can totally do it. And the reason why I know this is because I'm an exemplar of this. So maybe it's just. So it, it was like N of one, so maybe that was like a little bit erroneous, but it, since, <laughs> since I, like, I went through this myself, I've done this with lots of other people, and I've seen other people do it both successfully, and also I've seen people engage in the anti-patterns that screw their companies, and so I know it's like evidently doable. Okay, so that, that's kind of the goal, the goal of this conversation. And so the reason why you should believe me and not think I'm full of shit is because um, I actually, like, I'm a founder, I don't have any background in sales. So I went to Stanford undergrad, I majored in English and philosophy, I was a, a, a product marketer and a, pro, a product manager at VMware, no background in sales. And then when we started Talipin, as we were saying, uh, I had to be our first sales rep, then our first sales manager, then our VP of sales, and we were acquired by Monster. I led new product sales there. Since then I wrote a book on sales for founders called Founding Sales. Mainly because when I first started out, I was like, oh, okay, I'll just read the documentation on this. This will be like easy, right? Because that's what you do when you like, want to learn anything. <laughs> and there was like no docs, which was annoying. <laughs> um, which made learning it harder, but then I wrote the docs after the fact. Uh, and then as Ricky kind of pointed out, I run, I run the, the nation's largest sales operations, sales leadership community. Um, so I kind of just went through this, so I don't have to rehearse it for you. So I think um, one of the things that I like to talk about is like where does sales confusion come from or like sales uh, hesitancy or antipathy come from for founders? And it, it's largely just like an information gap where like if you think about the ways that, that most of us have, ex have experienced sales historically, it's either like, silly characters on television. Um, the other thing too, and I actually can speak to this because like I'm not a very extroverted guy, uh, that I think a lot of times when you have people who like have a technical background, it's not like, I don't really get a lot of joy of, out of interacting with like strangers multiple times a day and, and through sales calls. And so that, as a result, like that's gonna kind of lead you away from the behaviors or like make you wanna shy away from the behaviors that are important for sales. Uh, and then I think there's also kind of this like vestige conception of like the people who went into sales that like maybe, you know, you have, have the folks who went into sales because like, they clearly couldn't do, um, you know, they couldn't do chem, or they couldn't do calculus or whatever, and like, and, and so, and so I think that, so that, like, I understand, so I have empathy for this because that was my attitude previously, um, but it's actually just like not true, and and kind of modern sales is way different than this like old school kind of always be closing or like used car salesman. But like modern sales, all about like metrics and process excellence and what have you. Um, so actually, these people are oops, where's my son? Um, so these guys are actually kind of screwed now in a modern selling environment because uh, mo modern sales is more about math anyway. So like you know, like Biff is screwed in a in a modern sell selling environment. Um, so the problem is is that sometimes when you if you have these attitudes, you can kind of you can run into these anti-patterns that are, are kind of seductive. Like a, a good example of this is like uh, kind of some of the API-based folks who's like, hey, yeah, you know, we just publish the docs. People like show up magically and like, bye. Uh, or the kind of like the canonical like, oh, we don't have salespeople volunteer. <laughs> right? <laughs> utter bullshit. <laughs> right, just utter bullshit. I'm not 100% sure why people engage in that like mythologizing, like maybe it's for recruiting purposes, or maybe it's just this like founder kind of like hangover from this, but it's like other Like Twilio has a massive sales organization. So does Stripe. So does Stripe. Stripe bootstrapped off of like small companies that need to process payments or what have you, but like now as they're getting into like becoming a for real Z's enterprise, like they have a huge sales organization. Um, and that's always been the case with companies. Just call them like whatever business development. Um, 
So, so that's, that's an anti-pattern that you want to avoid. Um, there's some other anti-patterns too that come out of, um, that come out of this that you want to avoid as well. Uh, th this is a particularly dangerous one and, and kind of the one that we're going to focus on talking about why, like why you can't just do this. I call it like sprinkling some sales on it where rather than you figuring it out like your initial selling motion, like who your ideal customer profile is and how to sell them and what the pricing is and all those sort of things. Like, oh, I'll just, <coughs> I'll just like get one of these guys, right? Um, and that's not good because that's not what they're for, right? They, one, one helpful metaphor for early stage sales, and we'll kind of go through a maturity model here, is you're, you're kind of, you're building software, you know, and like you're building it on your local. And so, and then when, when, it's, when it's done, or like done-ish, <laughs> you're gonna deploy. And if it works, it's great. And then when you're in, in order to scale it out, you're gonna deploy across lots of Dropboxes, right? And those are like incremental sales reps. But a sales leader is, is the way to think about like a sales leader is more like a DevOps person uh, who's good at like racking machines and making sure that they're fed and watered and like hooked up appropriately and what have you and monitored. Uh, they're not the one who's going to like write the initial software. And so if you if you think that you're going to hire a VP of sales or an initial sales person or what have you, and they're going to figure this out, you're going to be sorely disappointed. There are some magical unicorns that are like that. Usually they're more like product marketers. They're like weaponized product managers or product marketers where they're very, very intimate with um, the problem space. But those humans are fairly rare. Like I'm, I'm probably a good example of, of that. Um, I just happen to have been the founder, but um, but it, it is it's more it, you are going to be better off you doing it than trying to like sniff out one of these humans to try to do it because the, the downside of, and so the downside associated with this and you see this very commonly. Have you guys ever read um, Steve Blank's um, Four Steps to the Epiphany or whatever it's going to be brand new to Startup Hunter's Manual? It's like a joke in it that talks about like a, a startup can't get to scale until they fire their first VP of sales. It's actually like. It's funny, but it's kind of an admission of failure. Insofar as like what you did was like you screwed up and did this, right? You shouldn't have hired a VP of sales until you knew that you could sell your offering like the first couple dozen. So that's it. And then another kind of anti-pattern to be aware of is actually like fake sales, where people are actually like they're buying it for the purpose of like it's a the accelerator currency model, where like hey quick everybody buy each other's shit and then that way like. You know, the Series C funds won't know any better. <laughs> um, but the problem with that is that you're actually not learning. And you're not actually, like, you're not proving that your, your product fits the market and delivers value and that people are willing to exchange money for that. So, that, yeah, this is like a sucky anti pattern. Both of these are sucky anti patterns. Um, so, I think if you think about why this kind of, we kind of touched on this already, but like, if you think about where founders come from, we don't necessarily have. We don't naturally have those those skill profile. You may, but most of us probably did like technical degrees or um, uh, or what have you, and so like you don't just naturally acquire those skills. Um, so it makes sense, right? But that doesn't mean so you're not naturally going to have them. That doesn't mean you can't build them. And then if you think about like where where sellers come from, and this kind of goes to why. This is problematic. We're, we're, most, most of where sales historically has been learned is through an apprenticeship model. Uh, and, and so the, the, what salespeople frequently don't have is process orientation. This sounds negative, uh, but it's, it's not. So like creativity, what I mean by that is like creativity of, of like a product manager sort as opposed to like creativity of a communication and kind of like empathy sort. And so this kind of goes back to the, the reason why it's dangerous to rely on a salesperson or a sales leader to, in order to concoct your, your initial go market. Uh, and so why does this, why does this suck? Uh, well, there's kind of two main anti-patterns here. One is like failure to launch. So this is like a really pleasant uh, Twitter conversation I had with the founder of Cover a while back where he was, you know, like Naval Ravikant tweeted something moronic, like, if you cold email people, like, kill yourself. And I was just like, you're a 
moron. <laughs> There's like huge, like huge companies that are built off of that as like cold emailing, cold calling, and what have you as a as a go market apparatus, including stuff that the balls have invested in. Um, and so this guy was wondering, he's like, oh my god, like you know, plus one thousand, so clear. And I was just like, you sell into local businesses, right? So actually, who was you're doing the event coordination thing? Yeah. Yeah, so eventually, probably what you'll have to do in order to get supply objects on your on your marketplace will be engaging with like local businesses, right? And so the same is true with Cover or Yelp or Grubhub or what have you. Like the way that the Groupon, the way that these organizations go to market is through like muscular inside sales, like sales motions. Um, and so sure enough, these, this company died, and which is sad because like local. The, actually, this, you can tell how old this slide is because I think Grubhub's market cap is eight billion dollars now. So I guess you should update this. Um, but yeah, the, the net is is that there's there's big enterprise value to be built in being good at go to market, right? Uh, the other thing to be careful about is related to the kind of like this one. So sloppy gross. So Zenefits is probably like pretty much like the best example of this where. If you try to scale before you have things tight, right? I guess to extend our, you know, software metaphor, if you deploy across, you know, hundreds of Amazon machines and your, you know, your, your code has like major memory leaks or whatever, it's not good, right? It's gonna be a disaster. And so Zenefits had that in spades with respect to their their go to market. They had upside down unit economics, they had bad operations, and what have you, and so. This is the downside. Like Zenefits is a great product, and like the, the hypothesis of like giving away free software in order to acquire SMBs and get their um, get their insurance premiums, and then maybe also some SaaS revenue. It's a great idea. Uh, it just was you know, problematically executed. So, um, so those, like so those are kind of like the downsides. This is why why like why why not to do that, and so what. I would propose to you instead is what I call founder-led selling, which is figuring it out on your own in a stepwise fashion, like through a series of stages. So you can get to the point where you can scale up in an, in a efficient, unit economically positive fashion that doesn't kill your company. Right? Um, and so I think one th this is kind of indexed off of some of what Steve Blank and Eric Ries talk about. Which is that we think about a lot of a lot of us. I mean, most of you have probably worked for startups or previously done startups. So I guess you probably have more um, more understanding of this than the average bear. But startups are not small, big companies. They're in, they're in a different business, right? We're in the business of figuring out, like, learning and solving solving problems, and then moving on to the next problem, taking it to market. So the problem is, like, we a lot of times people think of like value creation over time kind of being something like this. Whereas in startup land, obviously like we're way at the beginning of the time time series here. And so value creation kind of yeah, comes through stepwise uh, process. And as you turn over more cards and like you, your, your organization gets more valuable. And so, it's kind of ridiculous. I call it business motion and inflection points, but you know, the point is that it's, it's the point at which you figure something out. And so the, the, the kind of stages that I talk about, that I like to talk about is, is one, do we know what problem we're solving? This is why I asked you guys initially. I was like, okay, cool, did you guys do interviews with technical recruiters, right? Because the biggest thing, and this is kind of like the Paul Graham thing, of make something people want. The easiest way to kill your company is to build something that nobody gives a shit about, <laughs> right? And it's like a, a very common failure, failure pattern. So first, like, do we know the problem that we're solving and that people actually care about it? And so the best way, of course, to go about that is customer development interviews and what have you. So we're not going to talk about that too terribly much here. Um, so that, does it actually work? Because then we built something and it doesn't actually solve this problem. And then frequently it's like, no, it doesn't. Shit. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, hey, actually, look, it does work now. All right. Cool, will someone pay for it? Oh, crap. You know, no, 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 no. Okay, cool, yes, you know, someone, anyone who's not an incubator batch mate. 
<laughs> this would be like a new, a common VC, like a VC question. <laughs> so what proportion of your customer base are also in YC or 500? Um, and then will many people pay, of course, is a way that you kind of do that more. So yeah, do we know problem solving? Does it work? Will someone pay? Will many people pay? This is a really important one. Can non-founders sell it? Right, so like we developed this, our sales software, and we shove it into somebody else's brain, and then they operate. And then can we build a sales team, and we need your sales team? So it's all well in, like, you're kind of going from just like a handful of boxes to more like the service-oriented architecture. So maybe we have like SDRs, talking about ADs, and then can we max that out? And so this is the point at which you're kind of like off to the races, but the way that most organizations um, mess up is by not not going stepwise in this process. You know, trying to jump ahead before they're ready for it. And so the like quick question on the so, previous chart. This uh, one? Yeah. If you were to like put seed stage, series A, series B, like what stage would you say typically once you raise series A you should be at once you It really depends because like Seed and Series A and whatever, those are kind of like arbitrary arbitrary signifiers predicated on some VC who decided that they wanted to throw money at you. So like, you know, a Ditya could go raise like a Seed, an A, and a B without even like, maybe even knowing what the problem was he was solving. <laughs> because... <laughs> For humans. <laughs> no, I know, but like, I think <laughs> that's, that's a reductio ad absurdum argument for this. So, so I think generally speaking, the way that VCs look at these things um, is, and it changes with the market, is one, like pre-seed, we, we have an interesting hypothesis around a problem that needs to be solved. Maybe we've actually like validated that the problem, the problem exists. Maybe that validation was already done because you were a practitioner previously and you had that problem. Uh, seed is for the purpose of building a prototype and then proving that, that it actually works and creates some sort of quanta of value. And then frequently, um, and this is where things get muddy, depending on the VC, uh, a lot of times VCs will want to actually see that you have a proven distribution, proven distribution capacity. And so like at Talented, for instance, like we just suck at fundraising. And one of the, but we were good at sales. And, uh, and so one of the problems, the things that indicated us from raising A was, or always the, 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 the argument was, like, we'll write a check into this as soon as we can recognize the fact that like you'll be able to then take that check and then spin up 10 salespeople who then will immediately start like pumping out cash, right? Um, so you wanna have the unit proof of that. And then after that, like Series B, C, whatever, at that point it's like, miniature private equity, it's not really like venture anymore. Um, so I think that's kind of it, but I think that like your mileage will super vary. And the more important thing to think about is like, like forget those guys out there and just like, like build your business because what this is going to do is, is just build optionality for you. So if you, if many people will pay and, and non-founders can sell this, you are in a stoked situation because Salespeople are just like servers that emit cash. And so if you if you get to the point where you can stamp out incremental sales humans who can emit cash, you are in a very good situation because they pay for themselves and they pay for two engineers at the same time. So like a really good example of this would be, actually I think I, uh, maybe I got rid of this slide. So Glassdoor just got bought the other day. Actually, this is a really funny like case study. It's familiar with Glassdoor. Yeah. It just got bought. Put it was one point three billion dollars. It's like totally a fine outcome. Um, so who did they get bought by? Recruit. recruit. Who did you recruit previously by? Indeed. So do you guys know how much money that Glassdoor raised over its lifetime? It was like two hundred million dollars. Not not a small amount. Do you know how much money Indeed raised over its lifespan? $5 million. There was $5 million they got bought by Recruit for a billion dollars. This founder do it just fine. <laughs> so, and the reason why was because they were good at go to market. So, and then the other thing too is that when you get good at go to market, 
So venture is very high cost of capital. And so once you have like, uh, there's a good book. Uh, it, it's good-ish. Founding sales is way better for, for, your, for you guys to see case. Um, but like the closest thing to is this company, or this book called uh, Predictable Revenue. by this guy, um, Aaron Ross, who innovated the SDR function at Salesforce. And so, like by virtue of having predict, like a predictable revenue machine, where you know that you can rack a new AV, get him or her hooked up to a source of lead gen, and then like three months later, they just start like popping out cash. You actually don't need venture. You shouldn't be funding that with venture. You can actually fund that with like debt or like a line of credit because SVB is. If if you actually do have a predictable revenue model, SVB is more than happy to give you high cost of capital debt all day long, and you don't have to like you know give it to red. Uh, and so that's where this becomes really powerful. What, what's an example of a reason why non-founders couldn't sell? A reason why non-founders can't sell? Uh, yes. Um, just usually like lack of product, like lack of product and um, like it, it is possible, but in order to concoct an initial sales motion, you want to have like extreme, extreme, extreme uh, problem space intimacy. I see. Yeah, so some, what I'm asking is, you know, why is this a, a point on the, on the step function? You know, what uh, what could go wrong there? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought you were I, I thought you were asking the question about this, like why not to sprinkle some yeah, silver yeah, yeah. on it? Oh, why? Um, what would be? I, oh, we'll actually get into that. Let, let's actually just wait right. wait for that. But um, usually, because a founder just keeps it inside his or her head and does a shitty job of documentation. Okay. That would be like a blocker. I know how to sell this, but I didn't document it. Um, I guess, it, again, it's like bad. It's like code with no docs. Um, OK, cool. So yeah, so what we're going to do is we'll, we'll talk about some of these these stages. And we'll stop at a certain point, because you guys are all really early stage, so we don't have to talk about like, and then you double the sales order again. Like, I think that would probably be pretty premature. And we'd be like, it would be more probable for us to use that type of Q&A. But um, what we're just going to do is we're going to talk about some of these steps, and importantly, and, and um, did I send you these slides? Yeah. I okay, cool. You'll just email them to everyone, because these are kind of like pie charts. But importantly, like what one of the things I like to talk about is like, one, who's responsible for it? What's the exit criteria? Like, how do you know that you've done it? Right? It goes back to the grinding, 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 grinding. Okay, cool. Yay! Like, we did it. Um, what are the tools you're going to use? And then also, and, like the anti patterns will avoid. Like you're doing this wrong when you do this. Um, so customer development. This is the very very beginning. This is what I was asking you guys about. It's important to get in front of your customers, do interviews with them. Um, both having both the business and the tech founders involved with this is really important because like you're just going to have like you want it all in your brain. That said, you also want to have it recorded and transcribed and the ability to go back to it and what have you. Um, and of course, the anti pattern here is starting to build something like that, like going, to, going into a kid. What we did before TalentBin, um, so TalentBin was a pivot out of a company called Honestly.com, where we had this hypothesis that you could do Glassdoor for professionals, and like we just started building it without actually testing those hypotheses. That was stupid. We, were, we wasted like nine months of, uh, of time and capital doing that. Um, usually, the, the, that's just done by the, the individual founders. So great resources there. I don't know if you if you guys have read this. So Michael Sippy is one of the he's like VPs of product at Twitter, kind of like the drummer in Spinal Tap. But um, he was he was a, a VP of product at a, one of the many VPs of product <clears throat> at Twitter. Uh, but he has this really great article in first round review called Get in the Van that, that provides a uh, a framework for structured customer development interviews. I think I sent this to you guys. Didn't I? Yeah. It's pretty good. And of course, like lean startup and startup owners manual. I actually wrote a, a, a piece on customer advisory panels <clears throat> in first round review that's really good too. <laughs> Which is like, well, it, 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 essentially what, and I should probably update this model. Like, if you do your, like, the purpose of doing your interviews is such that you have like extreme problem space intimacy. And then what you can do is you can kind of like collect a posse along the way of people who are stoked on what it is that you're working on and you've like authenticated whether or not they have like their act together because you're gonna be able to tell the difference between like a customer interview with somebody who's like sharp and forward leaning versus somebody who's like kind of a dumbass and maybe you, like 
like you'll sell to them later, but like not in your early in your early batches. Uh, so customer advisory panels are really great way of just like bringing that posse along for the ride. Does this work? So I think the important thing there, of course, is just like predicated on your interviews with folks, you're gonna know the business pains that you're trying to solve. So in the case of Tonic, there's all this <clears throat> software engineering time that is wasted, trying to get data prepared in a way <clears throat> that that you can test, and uh, or you know, bugs that make it to production that like screw things up because you didn't test them properly because your data was bad. Cool. Well, we should obviously have synthetic data in order to solve that problem. Great. What are the KPIs that are going to measure that bugs getting to production, amount of engineering time spent on like stupidity, um, <clears throat> potential company killing risk associated with like taking customer data from production and letting engineers play around with it on the local, <laughs> um, <clears throat> stuff like that. So knowing what those KPIs are and then and then saying, great, we built the th we built this thing, does it reduce those? Does it reduce or improve those KPIs? Does this shit work? And so that, that's like the proof of value creation, right? Like we know that we save on a unit basis, we will save a given software engineer this amount of time, and software engineers are very expensive human beings, and so as a result, we save this amount of money for your organization, you should give us one-tenth of it. Right. Um, again, this is just going to be you <clears throat> doing it. Uh, resources there, these are a number of chapters from founding sales. <coughs> this is frequently done in a beta. Like alpha or beta, which you can populate from your posse, which you populate from your customer involvement interviews. Will someone pay? So this is really just like the the difference between cool. I get it that you're proving to me that you're going to save engineering resources, what have you. I may just not have enough time to pay for that. That would be seem kind of crazy, but we actually have to prove that when the rubber hits the road, they are going to actually pay for it. This is, of course, something that gets talked about in customer development interviews. Literally, like, cool, what would you pay for this sort of thing? And then sit there in stony silence until they answer. And again, this is going to be you. Oops, sorry. Yeah, it's largely going to be you. And this, I mean, this is not, this, this part is like really hard. This is gonna be like the most unnatural thing is presenting value to folks in a way that they can consume it and then compelling them to, to pay for the solution in question. So, why do you, why do you put will they pay after? Why isn't that earlier? I think it's part of the sort of. Why is it, why is it not before it doesn't actually create value? Yeah, or like part of that first. Impression. Yeah, I mean, I guess they're kind of concurrent. So the thing, it, it partially is reliant on how well capitalized. Like you can pre-sell stuff. That can be a great thing. And like maybe you guys have done that with Tonic. The thing that we screwed up at Talentbin was like we were really good at sales, and like because I think I think in part like I cheated a little bit because as with a background as a product marketer, I make really fun and entertaining like slides and narratives and what have you, people are like, oh yeah, cool, take my money. Um, but I think the important thing is to, in a SaaS world, if you can get their money and then it actually doesn't deliver value, that's not great, you're gonna screw up your metrics. So what you wanna do before, before you go out and <coughs> prove that you can sell this stuff, then like you actually wanna prove that it's creating economic value in the world. You can potentially do it concurrently, but the reason why I stage it this way is, moreover, it's a lot easier to sell something when you walk into, like, when you walk into an engineering leader's office and you're like, hi, we did this and we know demonstrably that, it's, that it reduces bugs on production by this and engineering hours spent on data prep brain damage by this. But yeah, how do you know that? Oh, well, we had a beta for six months with like, you know, a couple hundred engineers on it. That's why. Cool. So I looked on LinkedIn. It looks like you have 50 engineers right now. And what do you guys do for, 
you know, synthetic and data prep right now. Oh, you have all those 50 engineers working on that. Hmm. Cool. So you're in a much better, you're in a much stronger situation when you're like, when you can demonstrably, when you know that your stuff works. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I guess sometimes sales, the ability to this can be going to pay for your product is a good measure of whether or not they find value in it. So in that sense, you need to call it a different metric to measure value in it. Number of engineers that they can resource to other things, and the hours they. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's what I was saying about yeah. the, the KPIs and question. Yeah. Like, I get it. If you show up with an incontrovertible argument, yeah. so don't don't use sales or don't use revenue for the money you get from a customer too early. Don't use it, or don't use it as a metric too early. Yeah, like <clears throat> what what re like revenue is a revenue is a metric for kind of like more your ability to acquire customers. Like, I mean, look at Donald Trump. You can sell a lot of stuff that's useless, right? Yeah. Like, it doesn't mean that it's like necessarily valuable. Or sorry, it's Trump University, right? Yeah. Like, and so, and I don't think anyone, no one in this room wants to be in the business of like selling stuff that like accelerates yeah. the heat death in the universe. <laughs> like, we're just, <laughs> we're actually trying to yeah. create value for okay. our folks. Um, that makes sense. But later on, once we know that the reason why they're giving us money is to capture this value that is like proved, like proven through a our our initial beta, and then moreover on an ongoing basis from a customer success standpoint, because we should be instrumenting the value that is provided to. So like API companies have this easy, <laughs> like Square knows how much value they're providing because like and Stripe Stripe knows how much value they're providing because it's literally like API calls. In you guys' case. Um, yeah, the, the metric might be a little more challenging to yes, instrument. Tell like us you, what it is. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> tell us what it is. We, we, we want to know. <laughs> well, no, what you would want is you would want your customer success apparatus to be able to like point out, like, okay, cool, this is the amount of, like, this is how fresh your data was kept, and like, you know, ne never had to have an engineer work on it. Yeah. And typically, what that would have taken is as many engineering hours, which, <laughs> you know, times $75 an hour is. This huge number, yes. of which like your twenty five dollars an hour, one hundred fifty k a year. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Math. <laughs> um, okay, that answer your question, Ish. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So then the next step is like, will many people pay for this? And so this is going from this is where we're going from proving that we we could sell it to that actually we were like beginning to have a sales organization. Um, and like <clears throat> the ability to reliably and repeatedly sell this thing. So this is actually where you can start getting some abstraction in. So instead of you just soloing it, one of the hallmarks of a modern <clears throat> sales organization is is abstraction and specialization of, of roles because we have this magical thing called a CRM, which is a database that like share of, of shared customer state that other people can that everyone can index off of and write onto and read off of. Uh, and so one of the earliest example one of the earliest ways that you can leverage that is with a, a sales development helper, essentially a junior salesperson who's purely in the purely responsible for getting meetings on your calendar. Uh, the other kind of flip side of this, this is, so my buddy uh, Manny Medina is the founder of Outreach, and you may, some of you may be in this in this situation where if you're very well networked in the, the, the space that you play in, it actually may not be difficult for you to get meetings. So I, I'm like a good example of this right now. I know a lot of sales leaders and sales operations folks, so it's very easy for me to get meetings and, and create opportunities. Uh, so then the first, in this case, the, the thing where you, have an, where you have an opportunity for initial abstraction is by having a, a customer success person who does the, the important, by the way, back here, like you're doing the customer success as well. So it's not that like, we only start doing customer success once there's a customer success person. You can probably see the lead, gen, lead gens, is appointment setting, selling, and success. But what you, and so this is what we've done with Atrium, where I have two customer success managers right now, and I'm just like tossing hot potatoes over the wall to them. Cool, got another one. Take care of them. 
Uh, but this is where you start having, this is where you can add abstraction and leverage there. So what you, what you kind of want to see here, this is the point where you're proving that like it's not a fluke and you know, your first couple customers didn't just buy because they thought you were compelling and funny and what have you, but instead you can get to a couple dozen, dozen customers because it's, that's enough proof that it now makes sense for you to bring on incremental sales. So literally all this is just like running a loop on this initial, you know, the, the thing that got you those fir the first couple of customers is just continuing to do that until you're like, okay, cool. This is, and what you're gonna find is, again, a sales motion is akin to like a product or software where you're gonna find bugs in it. You're gonna, you're gonna identify feature <coughs> optimizations. And so as you loop through, you're gonna, identify that and get it better and document it such that it's all the more easy to then shove into somebody else's brain when you go to hire them. Yeah, and there's some resources there. So founding, the book Founding Sales is, um, is chronologically ordered, like the, the things that are important at the beginning, at the beginning, and the things that are important in the middle, in the middle. So like the thing that becomes important here is things like prospecting. So being able to identify lots of people that have, have your pain point. And appointment setting, pipeline management. Oh wow, I have 40 concurrent conversations going on and there's no way I can keep that all in my brain. That's what a CRM is for. Uh, can non-founders sell this? So this is, um, this is where like kind of the next step, the next maturity step where nailing this is that a question? Uh, this is where you're setting yourself up to really be able to scale up. So skipping this is very problematic from an opportunity cost standpoint. So um, this is like an example of like a, an organizational architecture for that where you potentially have a sales development rep who's feeding you and maybe a couple other account executives. You're still selling, but maybe you're dialing that back a little bit, so like maybe you're only, you have 10 customer facing meetings a week as opposed to 20 customer facing meetings a week. Why are you doing that? Because you're just like hanging out in South Park otherwise? No, you're not, you're spending your time managing and doing documentation and making slides and stuff like that. You were ideally doing that for yourself initially, but now you're turning your attention to doing that as like more and more of your job because this goes to your, your question earlier, like what would be what would be the things that would block these folks getting to success? And the things that would block that would be the like the understanding of how to sell this thing and all the because if you think about so there's this this terminology, it's kind of like more grandiose than it really needs to be, uh, of a sales motion. So a sales motion is essentially just Everything associated with selling your product, like all of it. So the messaging, who the ideal customer profile is, the staging, who do we have to meet with? Oh, well first we meet with the VP of engineering and then she kicks us to the QA manager or we can enter through the QA manager and then he kicks us over to the VP of engineering and this is the different messaging for those folks. It's like my buddy um, works at Rainforest QA, right? So. The sales messaging to the VP of engineering for Rainforest QA is way different than when you're talking to the QA folks because you know you don't roll up to the QA department and be like, hey, we're gonna obviate you. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like, no, no, and I know this because I used to work at VMware. So we had different messaging predicated on whether we were talking to the CIO versus if you're talking to the you know the IT admin or the, the DevOps person. It's it's not like, hey, your job's gonna go away. It's like, no, 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 you have way more important things to be working on than just like racking stuff and running cables. Wouldn't you agree? I guess I totally agree. So all of those things together are like the sales, along with objections as well, right? So, and so then having that documented in such a way that someone else can adopt it, and then moreover, so like that's one failure mode, is not having it sufficiently documented, but instead it's just like, an oral history, and then the other failure mode is not proactively like 
shoving it into their brain. But instead, they're like, oh, I'll just like pick it up. Right? Because generally speaking, the stuff we work on is new and innovative. So even if somebody previously, even if the seller in question, the salesperson, worked in a in a in a similar space. So like imagine that for tonic <coughs> we eventually hire you know rainforest reps or Atlassian reps or FD reps or New Relic reps or whatever. Yeah, they're like used to selling to DevOps or whatever, but like the notion of like selling the value proposition of synthetic data, like it's completely new. So even just because they know about like you know application performance monitoring doesn't mean that they're gonna like magically be able to grok you know the value proposition of synthetic data and like all the objections associated with it, what have you. So we have to put them in a headlock and like do the, the Vulcan mind meld with them. Because if you don't, they're like and you just rely on it being organic it's going to take a long time for them to ramp. And that's bad because you're paying them during that time when they're not paying you. So what is that process like? Sales onboarding and, um, and hiring. The good news is there's chapters on it <laughs> <laughs> in founding sets. So you can read that. Uh, but the point is just like the, I think the, the thing with all of this is, and this kind of goes, I won't flip back to the slides, but Sale, like sales excellence is no different than marketing, ex like marketing excellence is no different than engineering excellence or you know, DevOps excellence or whatever. Like approach it with intentionality and rigor and, and so like that's kind of the watch, the watch we're here. So how do you do it well? well? So first, do it well. <laughs> like commit to doing it well as opposed to doing it in a half-acid sort of fashion, which a lot of times sales organizations do do things in a half-assed, non-intentional fashion, again, because the people who have historically populated sales organizations are not the most rigorous people who, like, in the world. That's changing. So the way that that's kind of changing first is there's a, um, there's a function in sales organizations called sales operations that essentially is just like the puppet masters of sales, um, and that's more and more important. Now, eventually, there's there's a secondary trend of sales operations. So, sales operations people typically have like engineering backgrounds or finance backgrounds. Like, they're not afraid of math and process. There's a secondary trend that's happening where the people who end up being sales leaders in organizations come from that background, as opposed to coming from like being an actual like account executive. So, the traditional promotion path is like, okay, cool, you graduated from college, and what am I going to do? Like, I'm an English major, like Pete. I don't know. I guess I'll be an SDR. Um, then I become an AD, then I become an AD manager, and then like somehow I stumble my way into being a VP of sales without ever like learning Excel. <laughs> That's changing now. We're like the, the people who run sales organizations. It's it's taking time, but the people who run sales organizations are are math people crossed with salespeople as opposed to just pure salespeople who have who issue math. Um, but the, the, the deeper answer to your question is in this chapter. Right here. Yeah, so, but, but this is actually really important. So I'll, I won't read all of this, but the thing that people screw up here is like, cool, I got it. So on the one hand, what you don't want to do is like marvel in your newfound powers. <laughs> oh my God, I'm such a great seller <laughs> now. Because what our goal is as entrepreneurs is to scale enterprise value creation as quickly as possible. And you know, such that our investors can have a good IRR, just kidding. Um, <laughs> such that we don't, we can build more enterprise value quicker without having to raise more capital or get to profitability faster. And so you continuing to be a seller after you've already baked the the sales motion is actually like inefficient. What we want to be in the business of now is stamping out more humans, more more sales sales servers, right? So that's like one anti pattern. Another anti pattern is just like, all right, cool, like have fun, guys, like figure it out. That's why, like, I don't know exactly what the anti pattern there. It's kind of a little bit of a Goldilocks scenario, but um, question. So, um, yeah, so. Let's say what you, you say, what was the company you're working on again? I forget. Four Thought, which was 
Alexa could be an atomic joke. That's right, and then the atomic joke. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, let's say you got to the state where you, you know, you can repeatedly mint A's, right? Like, you, you, other people can sell it. Good, good job. Um, then, the, like, I've often seen in companies, for example, Palantir, even like MemSQL, like, the CEO, Palantir doesn't have sales people. <laughs> the CEO starts to take on, like, kind of moves up market to the big enterprise deals or something like that. I don't know if it's a common pattern. No, that's, that's yes, good job. So the so each news every time <clears throat> every time you go into a new segment, you're kind of doing this again. You're doing like an iteration loop each time. Now, frequently, like ideally, it's not totally new, but as you as you move into different organizations, like whether it's different verticals, say MemSQL. Yeah. Is, okay. I know the, the sales work there. Oh. Well, um, like a different vertical could have different needs, right? And so your value proposition, so like MemSQL, data stores are are good slash bad example of this because data stores are problematic because they have so many different use cases. So the value proposition, so like MemSQL, you know, streaming analytics is one thing that they they do really well, and um, and then there's like other use cases as well. So like. When you when you're going and selling into that other use case, having that sales motion baked also is important. And then similarly, if you go into a new segment, oftentimes like the purchasing process will be different. Um, new things will show up where, like, does it actually work? Could turn out that like your offering, if it doesn't have SAML, <laughs> it doesn't actually work in, in an enterprise because like they're like, yeah, you know what, we're not going to buy your stuff until. You have SAML because no one's allowed to log in with regular credentials. Right. So it's a pretty prosaic feature example, but your software doesn't work at that at that organization or at that segment. So to so to your point, what ends up and I don't know what the right kind of like visual metaphor <clears throat> would be here, but as as you move into new kind of categories, having like the person who de-risked and, and concocted that initial sales motion or the first category that you were in can now do it again in that category. Yeah, that makes sense. Ideally, it doesn't take us long. <laughs> you, reused, you reused some of the slides and the graphics and, and what have you. But yes, it's a very perceptive uh, uh, observation. It's like a very common like uh, pattern. The, the anti-pattern there, what was I talking about, about this? Uh, 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 also new products. Um, in an organization. So the anti-pattern there is like trying to get your existing sales reps like, oh, hey, here you go, guys, just go ahead and figure it out. It's, it's kind of the same like anti-pattern. Like, oh, okay, let's just go up market. Well, the, if the sales motion is different, you're now relying on like 10 sales reps to individually <laughs> concoct that. Like that sounds terrible. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So this is the one last thing I want to talk about that we can kind of like um, do Q and A. But I wanted to talk about why like, why this is so important. Like why the, why solving Zev, Zev's problem is is so important. And what it comes down to is you guys like my graphs uh, in Google Google uh, slides. <laughs> So this is a <clears throat> this is a sales human. So this is time, and then this is uh, money that they're either costing us or delivering to us. So the cool thing with a product of sales, I'll use Talentbin as an example. So Talentbin, our, our reps would sell 50k of recruiting, of super snazzy recruiting software per month, and they those those sales reps had a hundred and twenty k on target. This was a while ago. It's being more expensive now because uh, rent prices. Um, but 120k OTE. So let's say that they cost around like 10k a month, and they gross it up. So let's say it costs like 15k for a rep per month. Well, if they're not delivering deals, they're costing us money. But as they, <clears throat> as you bring them on board, and you do the bulk and mind meld, and get them to the point where they understand the sales motion, and you're 
doing lots of push-ups with them in order to get them to the point where they can sell well, and then they start taking customer meetings, but then the problem is your sales cycle takes 60 days, so you're only gonna start seeing deals pop out of the pipeline 60 days after, at best, 60 days after the first meetings that they're taking. So this, this goes to why it's so important to onboard rigorously and well, because the more you can compress this, pull this forward, the better off you are, because what you want them to get to is the point where they're just like shedding cash. So, and this is kind of what that looks like integrated. So then now imagine, so the way that, that sales organizations scale out is you, just, you don't have an individual sales rep sell more stuff, you just, because the way the sales reps work is, and again this is like direct selling, they, they sell by having meetings with customers. Okay, well there's only 40 or 50 hours in a week, so you're, you're capped out at a certain amount of capacity, it doesn't scale, I and mean, this is why there's like attractions to um, organizations that have negative churn, like a Twilio or a Slack or, or what have you, because you sell it initially and then it kind of like grows. But, um, but pretend like you have a normal business, not like that. The way that then you do this, the way that like scale up happens is you just do it with more reps. So initially it costs you like 60K and then you know 60K per month is your cost. And then once those four reps are jamming along, they're just like throwing off 180K per, per month. And so what ends up, the, like the way that efficient scale up works is that once those folks have gotten up, and are now steady stated, you then turn your attention to bringing on a new cohort of reps. And again, like you take a divot, an investment J curve, and then if they're, they're unit economically negative at that point, and then they ramp up. And then now you're at a new level of, of cash production. And so like that's just like this is this right here is how direct sales scales up if you're doing it efficiently. And then of course that right there is like the first renewal because ideally our software is sticky and people get value out of it so when it comes up for renewal 95% of people renew and at that point we didn't have to sell it a second time and just renew. So now, now contrast that to if you're not ramping your reps well and instead instead of it taking Two months, it takes four months, or instead of taking three months, it takes six months. So you have this elongated period of cash consumption, which as you then scale up, you're just gonna eat more cash, which means that you're gonna have to go back to these folks for money more frequently. Um, or maybe not, but you're just not gonna scale up as quickly. So th this right here, this is the, like, this is the delta between having an intentional and rigorous hiring and onboarding process and having one that's like half-assed and inefficient. And like it actually like adds up. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop there because that's kind of like the most important stuff for you all, like this, the stage that you're at. Later on, yeah, later on you essentially just like fractal out so going from like getting completely out of the business of selling and then having like a unit of revenue production, like you said, development rep, the powers to account executives, and then powers of customer success, but like these ratios may be different predicated on how, uh, on what your market looks like. And then this is just a sales team that is three of those units. And then this is just a, a bigger sales team that is six of those units. And at this point, you probably have a sales, oh yeah, cool, you have a sales operations person to bring that order to the chaos. Um, oh yeah, here's that slide. Yeah, this is my, my point about the, the upside associated with this. Like, these guys are amazing because they built Indeed off of a, you know, a five million, this is a really good outcome from Union Square Ventures. <laughs> <laughs> With Indeed, Indeed is somewhat of a marketplace, right? Because you do need um, need the applicant side of the market to, to sell anything to, to 
other folks. So did they have to go through the same sales scaling process, or yeah, totally. Like I mean, they like you still have to figure out how you attract. Well, users. in their case, actually, the reason one of their other reasons why Indeed was really mm -hmm. capital efficient because they were just like traffic arbitrageurs, where they could just buy clicks on they could buy Google AdWords clicks. So when someone searched for sales rep Austin or sales rep job, and they knew they were in Austin, mm -hmm. then Indeed could buy those clicks funnel them to their search engine, or funnel them to a landing page of a sales rep jobs in, in Austin, and then that sales that aspiring sales rep clicked on you know, six of those, or what have you. Each of, so Indeed bought the click for <clears throat> 50 cents, and then sold the click to, who's a sales organization in Austin, uh, Trendkite. Uh, sold the click to Trendkite for $3. Right. They still have to sell Trendkite. You go to them and yep. you're like, Hey, cool! You know how you're used to paying $150 for a monster job post? Yeah. What you're going to do is buy clicks. So, so there's a separate organization that was figuring out how to sell to users, which is in this case would be SEM. Or when you say of, sell to users, you mean like uh, applicants, candidates? Yeah, candidates. Oh yeah, that's like traffic acquisition. I mean, that's like that's that's like consumer marketing type. Yeah, totally. So like people think, oh, like LinkedIn is a consumer business. No, it's not. Yeah. Like LinkedIn, selling LinkedIn sells. Eight, like nine thousand dollars seats of LinkedIn recruiter to recruits, yeah. like that's the business of theirs. It's actually the only business of theirs. It's like any good. Well, LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, which essentially is just LinkedIn recruiter for sales, is is way cheaper, but also other kind of like important line of business. Um, cool. So, like questions on this stuff, yeah. Um, so we were talking about Slack earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're an organization that seemed to start with like SMB and then like made their way into enterprise. So, yep. what have you seen as like some of the like, anti patterns and like making that transition and some of the things that you know, might go wrong there? Yeah. So, great question. It is like there's there's a lot of dead companies along that path. So, actually, I have a slide on, on Dropbox in here, but I dropped it out because I didn't know if like where she was going to be. Um, so the 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 anti pattern associated with either SMB sales or like self service businesses is thinking that that's actually a business, as opposed to it being lead gen. So a good example of this: there's this company. <clears throat> you guys familiar with Yesware? Yeah. yeah. So Yesware makes um, it's really cute. It makes this like cute. Uh, Email, they call it email for salespeople. What it allows you to do is put a tracking pixel in your email, allows you to like boomerang it back to you, so that you're like, oh, hey, I need to follow up with this person, they need to get back to me, great. Um, so it's like very like rudimentary stuff. Huge market share because it's permissionless install. Right, any salesperson <clears throat> can install it in Chrome, in Gmail, use it. The problem was is that like they didn't go up market, and they didn't think about what the other features that were required in order to really sell to sales organizations. So right now, what they have is like tens and tens of thousands of people paying them ten or or like not ten, like twenty or thirty or forty dollars a month. But then there's these two these two companies, Outreach and Sales Loft, who have come in and are just completely eating the market alive by building more robust functionality around automation. And then also building a product that serves the needs of the, the sales operations people who orchestrate larger organizations. So Yesware is like a really cool, Yesware was really great, like lead gen for Yesware. And then they, they, they cap themselves out, right? And you can say the same thing about Dropbox. Dropbox, I kind of have like a love-hate relationship with their go-to-market insofar as like, on the one hand, it's fantastic. You can figure out a way to build a twelve billion dollar business. Like, what's the average? The, I think the average customer value right now is like a hundred dollars a month. <laughs> um, that's like kind of awesome. There's very few markets where I think where that can happen because you have to think about how many people there are who could use the thing in question. So, like file sharing, a lot, right? Um, so Slack seems to be navigating it okay. That, so yes, we did not. They're like going to be a bad company, or like not a great acquisition, probably. Um, Box 
Fox did an okay job of like Fox got religion early on um, and did an okay job of kind of like transitioning from like land and expanding sort of to like the real enterprise selling. Um, but I think the important thing is to not mistake the fact, oh yeah, I guess like Stripe. Stripe's a really good example of that. Developer tools, like this is a frequent go-to-market behavior with, with in developer tools because the nice thing about developers is like they know the problem that they have and they also, like they know the problem they have, they're, they're willing to do the research to find a solution to it and then they're savvy enough in order to install it and like use it. But even there, so like you look at New Relic versus App Dynamics, they, they still, their, their bread and butter now is not the people who are installing the New Relic monitoring agent in order to get a beta nerd t-shirt that was like lead generation like early on you can prove that market and maybe like make some revenue off of it which is fantastic but just don't mistake it for being kind of that end goal that would be like the big, the big thing <coughs> but there, there's a there's a, a growing body of like thinking and research kind of overstating the case around this this notion of what's known as a product qualified lead, which is like known as PQL. Um, the earliest examples of this were open source software where <clears throat> anybody could download it. And so like the software itself was kind of like lead generation for the service. So like Red Hat was the earliest example, one of the earliest examples of this. The software was lead generation for like the services model. Then like Cloud Era would do that with like their, their distributions and they sold like special specialized like management software for it. I think Docker is doing some similar stuff. You can do that with non-technical products as well. So like SaaS, or I'm sorry, not SaaS. Slack is a good example of this. Like Slack, I like to say that Slack is like an organizational virus. Like as long as people have administrative rights to their machines, any group can just like decide to install it and start using it and then um, like permissionlessly. And then the Slack sales organization is just monitoring there and they're like, oh look, we have a patch of people using over here with at Raytheon.com addresses. Uh-oh. <laughs> But if, they, if you don't do that and you're just like, oh, okay, cool, they installed it, that's great. And they didn't pay attention to the fact that they had an at Raytheon.com email address and like maybe we should engage with them and help it spread within the organization and go to the CIO and say like, hey, you should give us like millions of dollars for this. If they didn't do that, that would be bad. And then, and then more, so Slack is doing a good job of that because their risk is in the enterprise where people don't have administrative rights to their machines so their organizational virus distribution mechanism doesn't really work in the enterprise as well. So, and you know who does have a lot of traction in the enterprise? Microsoft. You know what they give away? Teams. Give away Microsoft Teams. So that's why the like Slack, we don't have salespeople thing. I was, uh, Stuart Butterfield was talk, talking at a GGB Capital event the other day. He was like, I don't know. I don't think I ever actually said that because I love our sales team. And I was like, sure, buddy. Does <laughs> <laughs> uh, that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Other questions? So you did a good job of breaking out the steps in terms of how founder kind of separates <clears throat> himself from sales. So I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about the sales ops side and at what point the founder kind of cleaves himself from that process and what that looks like as they're kind of exploring and figuring out the product they have and everything that comes with it. Cool. When the founder cleaves us off from where? Just sales ops in general. So like anything from lead gen to, cause like obviously at the beginning they're doing everything from like AE to like account managing yeah. to everything else. And like if they're trying to also bring someone on and make product decisions or something like that, what that looks like. Yeah, I guess in this visual model here, like I have this, this kind of like sale, selling behavior spectrum here, like lead gen to sell, to <laughs> success. But there should be like this overarching thing, which is like management. Um, so, so sales operations, is just like the operations component, like operational excellence subcomponent of management. Back in the day, that's what management's job was. It just happened to be that like a lot of sales management wasn't particularly predisposed to, to that stuff. So, I mean, this is the point right here, right, where you you're doing this, and I think it talk about this. So you'd have like this SDR, like basically lead hunting and everything else through that process, or? No, like in this case, like literally you're, so this is what management is. Okay. As a manager, your job is not to do work. <laughs> your, your, your job is to empower the work of these folks. So if your sales development rep is spending time manually going through Crunchbase or <laughs> whatever else, like 
cool, you should identify that as a critical path and take that away, take that away from him and say, cool, what we're gonna do is we're gonna buy access to Discover Org or Zoom Info or Datanize or what have you, or I'm gonna spin up 10 people on Upwork to go and manually do the thing that you're doing right now and then we're gonna shove that into the CRM such that when like you show up in the morning, there's just like a full barrel of fish for you to shoot at with outreach. Um, and so that's just like one example. So your job now becomes optimization of the, the sales the sales organization, whether it's high, like whether it's hiring and doing a good job of making sure that you're having lots of recruiting meetings and that you're authenticating skill well and that you're onboarding them well and you're making them do repetitions of, of your pitch until like you're both bleeding out of your ears and what have you all the way to ongoing coaching, listening to their listening to their calls, like sitting next to them, setting up a metrics harness. Is that actually I talked about this? I, this chapter. Okay. Right here. So like the things that like the things that you do as a manager, I mean it is still work. It is just different work. And and you have to recognize the fact that you need to be spending your time doing those things as opposed to spending your time doing the things that you're doing for yourself. Other questions? So if you're like an engineer, right? Uh, oh. Engineer or product manager, classic founding team, you don't have a sales DNA day one and try to hire your first salesperson. Like what what questions should uh, should they ask? Like what, any advice should they uh, go about about that? You know, so, well, so first, you should have sold it yourself, as as discussed. And if you're going and trying to hire a salesperson before you have sold enough of it, a statistically significant amount of it yourself, don't do that. Uh, because that's going to put you, you having done it yourself, in addition to proving that it actually can be done, rather than hiring some salespeople who won't be able to prove that and just waste a bunch of your money, it actually puts you in a breathtakingly good position from a hiring and a management standpoint. So if you hire some salespeople before you've proven that you can sell it, and they're like, you know what, this product is just a piece of shit. No one can sell it. And then your response is like, that's funny, I sold three hundred thousand dollars of it. Right? You've you've <clears throat> avoided that. So that and then moreover, hiring is also hiring and onboarding becomes a lot easier <clears throat> if you if you've sold it yourself. As well. So the, all that being said, I think the, the patterns of the people that you want to look at, well, so first of all, your first hire actually may not be an account executive, it might be a sales development person, or it might be a customer success person, first and foremost. But let's say that it's not, <clears throat> or, or you have hired one of those folks, and now you're going to hire an account executive. Uh, early stage sales is like way different than, so like MemSeq is a good example. One of the things that they've done that wasn't great in their sales organizations, they're hiring lots of like, you know, super tenured reps out of Oracle, thinking like, oh, they've got the relationships and blah, 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 blah. Relationships don't, like, it, it depends on the market, but generally speaking, we live in an information availability world. The reason why relationships used to matter in sales was because like literally you didn't know who the humans were in these organizations that had budget. Now we have this directory called LinkedIn. And you just look for the VP of engineering in the organization and go and reach out to her or him. So, um, so what you wanna do is, is have people who, usually the best early stage sales folks are, yes, folks that are in your category. So a friend of mine was an early sales rep at Lever and then he just went and joined um, Sapling. Sapling makes this like interesting, it's kind of like Zapier for like HR tech. Describe it, but like this guy, his name is Mike Bullard. He's fantastic. He was an early, I mean, he was like a junior sales rep at Box. He's a sharp guy. Um, you know, he's creative. He, but like, sales guy, like, does a great job of selling. Like, he's not going to concoct the, the sales behavior, but he's comfortable with uncertainty and he's comfortable with like an incomplete product and he's, and he's comfortable in new markets. Now, you can't just like hand him a product and be like, hey, so this, you should just figure it out. But like that, and so in his case, he what like he killed it at Lever, he degraded Box, and now he's 
going to sell at another HR tech company, where again, it, like Sapling is where Lever was two years ago. So like that's a good like pattern. When you don't like, the anti pattern there is going and hiring the super again kind of contingent on the market, hiring the super tenured rep who is maybe making like three hundred thousand dollars on target at Oracle or what have you, and is used to this huge supporting infrastructure. Like I show up and I'm like, hey, I'm from Oracle. It's time to pay me again. I hope the check is bigger than last time. Don't make me take your database away. That's like so much different than showing up and like trying to sell sapling or slap or, or what have you. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and would you, in terms of like personality, like I hear people say like, you know, the hunter and the farmer, farmer and, mm -hmm. and those type, like in your experience, uh, is it like a certain personality fits better for early stage? Oh, yeah. Sorry, you just sort of want that like, uh, rabbit hunting that group. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, one of the things, like, you'll see this when you're when you're selling as well. This is, I don't know, the very, very first chapter in founding sales, I don't know where I went. The very first chapter in founding sales is on sales mindset changes. Like, some of the stuff you have to do when you're selling, like, it feels like mildly sociopathic. Like, you're not used to having seven of the same conversations every day. Mm. It's weird. Like you don't do that as a normal human being. It just becomes the thing you do in, in sales. Same with recruiting as well. Um, like it's not natural to ask somebody like, cool, so how do you buy software? Do you have budget for this? Do you have the authority to make these purchases? Like, it's, it's not, you know, like ask people that at like a cocktail party. Um, so, what you want is somebody who is, and, and this is why I, the preamble of this conversation was that you can get there. Like, that, like I used to blanch at those sort of behaviors as well, and now I'm just like utterly incorrigible because you just become callous to it. So, you want somebody who is high activity, who's unflappable, etc. But also, you know, high high intellectual acumen as well. What you don't want necessarily is, and again, this is continuous. Like Memsegel is potentially one of the only companies where, at this point, where it can make sense to go that, and also like healthcare, right? Like stodgy markets where they're not willing to like buy and adopt new technology on prem stuff. Like I guess like Nutanix would probably be a good example of this. Trying to think of like a more recent infrastructure company where you would like go and do something like that. Pure like storage. What's that? Pure storage. Yeah, but even that's like seven years old, right? I'm thinking like a more more recent one. Databricks, Rubrik. 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 what do they do? Backup. Backup for like for people administering their own data centers. Yeah. Yeah. So like in those sort of scenarios, it actually might matter to have somebody who to like hire somebody who has the quote unquote Rolodex. But generally speaking, when you're hiring somebody who is like a Rolodex, you're probably hiring somebody who doesn't like to do work. And that's really fucking bad in, in startups. Uh, other questions? Time for one and a half more. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned the stages in the very early days, first like customer development, then figuring out if you build value, and then figuring out if somebody will pay for it. Yep. And so on. Um, one question I always have, and like most people I have, is knowing how much of it to do. Like, how much customer discovery? How many meetings should you be having? Like, yeah. And what is good? And what's good to benchmark? I think I'm sorry about this a little bit. Like exit criteria. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, that's mealy mouth. A statistically significant count. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Obviously. <laughs> uh, I think actually Sippy talks about this here. I mean, said all these things are an S curve. So even in customer development, like you'll do a couple, like we did a whole lot of customer development for Atrium. We did like 100 plus customer interviews. Now, that being said, like as you're doing your customer interviews, whoops, one slide. Like, <laughs> you're constantly doing lead gen. Yeah. So it has like, it has this positive externality. 
if you have a nice aquarium to toss them into, you're going to come back to it. But um, but Sippy talks about this. He's like, yeah, like after a couple dozen, you're going to start you're going to start hearing a lot of patterns. At which point, it depends on how deep you want to go. So the other thing too is it's important to be very like to be matrixed in your customer development. So use us as an example. When we were uh, doing our research. We matrix based on size of organization. We matrix based on um, discipline that we were interviewing. So whether it was like sales or customer success or engineering, and then we matrix based on uh, persona. So individual sales rep, sales manager, sales leader, sales operations, mm -hmm. individual customer success person, customer success leader, etc. And so if you can get like five of each of those, I mean that's a lot of work, but you're gonna have a stupid amount of like expertise in, in that market. So last one. I'm curious like how much of this applies and doesn't apply for B2B uh, B2BSC. So in my case it's like twenty percent of my revenue comes from enterprise and eighty percent comes from the consumer. Because I'm selling enterprise and the, the users are actually take like parents, like employees at that company who sure. use the daycares and then pay the bulk of it. Yeah. So like how much of this is like not as relevant versus well I think it's it's still super relevant because you have to sell those mm -hmm. those employers, right? Yeah. So but no, but all the revenue comes from selling the employers because if you don't have if the employer isn't because of how you deploy it, then you don't make that other eighty percent, right? Uh yeah. Oh, I guess this is like a strategic because I could go consumer as well. Don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I can go direct to consumer and not don't do that. No, I mean this is. You guys know Chariot. Mm -hmm. You guys know Ollie. Yeah. Yeah. So that is like long whiskey driven like fight. <clears throat> like three years ago, when he was trying to do like pure consumer stuff, because like CAC is CAC is annoying, and then also when you're a marketplace, you want to have liquidity. So what better way of getting like a huge lump of demand than like closing Dropbox? And now you have like guaranteed <laughs> demand. Like, okay, basis. cool. On a recurring basis, like yeah. it turns out, people go here a lot um, <laughs> every day. Yeah, most <laughs> weird. Um, and then more of, like now you can run all your, <clears throat> you can now fund a bunch of paths to Dropbox. Oh, look who's next door. Oh, hey, it's Pinterest. What's up, Pinterest? We already have a bunch of routes that we stood up based on Dropbox's recurring demand, and so now you're like, so. I mean, my reaction to, to your question is, like, I think that the way that you're going about it makes a lot of sense, and then you would bootstrap the marketplace yeah. using those big lumps of supply and demand, yeah. and then you can open a consumer business. Like, there's people who use Chariot that use it to, you know, get to some, like, small startup. Like, it's, like, in the broom closet at Dropbox, but the reason why that route runs right there is because it gets Dropbox signed up. Yeah. Cool, is that it? Yep. All right. Good. Thanks, guys. Wait a minute. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you guys can find. So, uh, Ricky's going to send this out. Um, this is like all the, all the resources are hyperlinked for the different stages. And um, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can email me. I'll hang out. We'll just hang out for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. So, there's more beer in the back, so come. See you. Good questions. <laughs> yeah, just